Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a great time at Web Summit. Um, so the session is uh, how to successfully build a health tech unicorn. Zach, you're going you're gonna to tell us all about it now in the next uh, 17 minutes. So <laughs> per perhaps to start, a good place to start would be to, where was the inspiration for your, where did that come from? And, and, how, and can you tell us about your journey to where you are now? Yeah, so just a few minutes on Flatiron. Um, my my co-founder and I have a atypical background. We we come from a software background, not a, a healthcare background. And we had worked in online advertising for almost five years. Uh, we worked at Google for for the final two. Uh, and while we were at Google, um, we had had some family cases of of cancer that you kind of experience it from the, the patient side of the world and, and you look at this problem and, and something doesn't feel right. It feels inefficient in, in many ways. Uh, and we just got very, very interested in, in oncology and in cancer care. Uh, so we spent about 18 months while a little bit at Google, just not tell them that, uh, and then a little bit after Google doing research uh, yeah. before we started Flutter. Okay. And uh, you talk about your, your software background versus a healthcare background. Do you think that's perhaps part of the reason behind your success? So at Flatiron, we talk about this a lot. I think it's important for any kind of software company in healthcare, which is you kind of have to be both. Uh, I think a lot of companies come at this from, from one angle or the other. They say, well, we're a software company and we're disrupting healthcare, or it's a, a physician-led company that's trying to learn how to do software, and they tend to spike in one direction or the other. And I think for us, at least what's worked really well at Flatiron and what's gotten us to, to where we are today is just appreciating the fact that both disciplines are, are critical. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have you know, 150 software engineers from Google and Facebook and Microsoft and all of the names. Um, we also have 12 full-time medical oncologists who work uh, in our office. We have about 30 oncology nurses and nurse practitioners. We have PharmDs, uh, all working side by side. And, and a lot of what we talk about in terms of you know, how to build a good health tech company is having those disciplines actually just talk to each other every single day. So it's not uncommon, you know, to, during stand-up or any of our scrum meetings uh, for it to be, you know, an engineer talking to a doctor, talking to an informaticist, talking to a statistician, all in, in one circle. And I think that's what makes this, this work. Mm. Was, it, was it hard to get those clinicians on board and, and to improve the communication between the two sides of the business? Yeah. Uh, re re recruiting our oncologists, I, I could write a book. Uh, <laughs> about how hard that was. First, the first problem is, is that you know, we're, we're fairly young, and, and I think a lot of folks look, from the healthcare industry at least, look skeptically on, uh, on folks who don't have you know, an MD or a PhD. Uh, and I'm, I'm a college dropout, so I don't even have like the bachelors. Um, and so it took a while to build up the credibility. Um, but we just kept learning. We kept kind of fighting at it. And, we ended up hiring our, our chief medical officer, who's this amazing oncologist. She was at Duke for 25 years. Uh, and hiring her, I think, was probably the biggest game changer for, for us, because she's able to attract the level of talent in, in oncology that we're able to attract in, in tech. Uh, and putting those together was, was critical. But it was not easy. That was a lot of work. <laughs> what would you say was your biggest challenge then? The terminology. OK. Yeah, I think in like every industry, uh, people who live in that industry for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, you end up, you use acronyms that you, like, I don't know why it's an acronym and words that just make things a little harder than they need to be. And, and for a, a, an outsider, which is what we were when we started Flatiron, just learning the, the nuances of, okay, that term means this term so that you could ask questions in a much more intelligent way, that was tough. Um, and we spent a lot of time before meetings and after meetings, this is me and my, my co-founder, discussing how are we going to ask this question? And how do we interpret the feedback? And, and what does it mean when they say payer versus insurance company, for example? Little, little things like that I, I think really matter because for most folks, this is the terminology they've used for their whole career. But for a bunch of folks getting into the industry, you know, it's not second nature to us. So we, we had to learn it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I mean, the health tech unicorns are very rare. What, why, why do you think that is? Yeah. I mean, healthcare is. So the, the unicorn thing is such a bullshit uh, <laughs> number. You know, it's like a, when we raised, so we raised money at a, at a billion dollar valuation, but it's, it's a market of one investor, right? So it's, you know, one person's opinion. It's not like a true valuation. And I always like to remind our employees that at the end of the day, like the paper valuation means nothing. Uh, you know, that plus a Metro card gets you on the subway kind of thing. Um, but what's more important is actually building a, a good business. You have to have fundamentals 
Um, and I think what people struggle with in healthcare, and this is, this is somewhat of a US-centric view, and, and globally it's a little different, but in the US, um, a good product is not necessarily a good business. Uh, and that's the way, in healthcare, that's the way the system is set up, where the person receiving the care isn't actually paying for the care, their insurance company is paying for the care. And then typically, if you think of who's the customer of the insurance company, at least in the United States, it tends to be the employer, not actually the individual patients. You have this weird series of incentives where if you don't understand how all of those incentives work, I think it's very difficult to build a real business. Um, and I think a lot of companies struggle to get that escape velocity out. You know, they'll get to 10, 20, 30 million in revenue, which is not a bad business, a good business, but to be, you know, up in the, in the billions, I think you need to cross that 100 million threshold and that's, that's non-trivial to get there. I mean, is it really that important that you, you cross that threshold like so early on in your business's lifespan? You no, I don't, think, I don't think it matters. I, I think it, mm. you just have to build a good company at the end of the day where, you know, you have great products that people like, you've got a good margin. That's another thing most folks forget is like you actually have to make money on the thing that you're selling. Um, and it has to be sustainable and, and protectable. Uh, so you need to think about your, your moats and what makes you better than the next person. Um, but getting to that valuation, I think that the timeline is somewhat irrelevant. Um, if you can get there, great. But that's not to say that, you know, a billion dollar startup is that's not necessarily the, the goal, I think, for lots of companies. Um, you know, a, a $10 million startup is a perfectly fine thing for, for many folks. So uh, it depends what your goals, your goals are. Yeah, okay. And you, you talked about sort of the difficulties around, you know, identifying who the payer is. Is there also sort of an issue around regulation and, and politics? And, and how, how do you overcome those obstacles? Yeah, so re regulation is a topic I, I do really enjoy talking about, which is such a weird, uh, weird thing. But, um, <laughs> The thing that I like about regulation is that it scares a lot of really smart people away. And so for us, like when we get to work in oncology, there's, you know, we don't have to worry about the five person startup coming out of Stanford of just extremely sharp uh, software engineers because most of them get scared away by the regulation. So it creates this like nice organic barrier to entry in a, in a weird way. Um, it's also not that complicated. You just have to read the rules. And if you can sit and read the rules and understand the rules and bring in a set of experts who can interpret them for you, so whether they're privacy laws or FDA or uh, CMS, whomever writes the, the regulation, if you can understand them and you can understand how to work within them, I actually think it's, it's fine. It's just a matter of you know, recognizing that it's important. Uh, so the way we've solved this at, at Flatiron is we hire experts. Uh, and we don't hire them as consultants, we hire them as full-time employees. Okay. So, you know, folks with FDA background, um, with privacy and HIPAA backgrounds, they, they work here hand-in-hand -hand with, our, with our engineering teams. And that makes a real difference if they just work for you. Yeah, because I think interpreting the regulation mm. into your software, for example, yeah. it's, it's gray. It's, it's somewhat vague in what that interpretation looks like, and so mm. you have to have a, an ongoing conversation. Uh, so we have, you know, a big regulatory team. Um, it's expensive, and I think that's the part that people miss. This is why if you see healthcare companies, healthcare startups like, like Flatiron and others, you know, we've raised almost $350 million. Mm -hmm. And we've had to raise that much money because we have overhead in uh, security and privacy and, and regulatory that you know, a typical software, consumer software company doesn't have. Um, we have a lot of it, so it's expensive. Yeah, and, and how about the political side of things? Obviously, things like Obamacare, et cetera, it's, it's very controversial. It's yeah, nice, one thing about, and this is unique to oncology and to mm -hmm. Flatiron, and it is not true of other companies, is that we're not super affected by the ACA or Obamacare. Mm -hmm. um, it's something we keep an eye on in case you know incentives are changing and, and you do want to understand it. But for us, uh, what we focus on is generating evidence about how cancer therapies are, are used in the real world. So if you take a drug out of a clinical trial setting, maybe in the trial it's seen 200, 300 people, you put it in the real world, now it sees tens of thousands of people and the way that the drug performs in terms of its safety and efficacy uh, is different. And Flatiron as a company, uh, we help to measure how different those uh, outcomes are. And we use electronic health record data to, to do that measurement. And that, that's really Flatiron in a nutshell. Um, insurance doesn't play a huge role in, in our business, but if you're you know, Oscar or, or any other health insurance startup, it, it does. Um, so it just depends on the, on the company, I think. 
And I mean, in terms of who your customers are, they're, they're, they're essentially the clinicians rather than the actual, the actual patient being treated. Do you think that is, has helped contribute to your success as a health startup rather than being, I don't know, say an app that's going to help you measure your number of steps you take or something? Yeah, pa patient facing or, or patient direct, that's tough. I mean, you, you don't see a lot of uh, successful startups in that area because the patient typically is not paying for the service. And so you have this reimbursement challenge where, you know, you build a great product, but there's no willingness to pay because most people are not used to paying for their own health care. Mm -hmm. And so it gets this weird incentive structure. Uh, so for us, yeah, we've, we've stuck to the enterprise, to physicians, clinicians, and to biopharma, so, you know, drug developers and researchers. Uh, and that's, that's been helpful. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I guess the danger with any tech is, you know, technology is just advancing at such a, such a fast pace. How do you avoid obsolescence? How do you keep ahead of your competition? Yeah. Um, I mean, we just work at it. You know, there's no like, there's no silver bullet. Um, mm -hmm. It's a startup, like it's supposed to be hard. It's not supposed to be this like walk in the park. I mean, we work, I probably work 80, 90 hours a week. Like this is the best vacation I've had in a long time. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's tough work. I think it's intricate, detailed work in particular. So we look to hire people who have this obsession with the minutia, and they're detail-oriented. And, and we, you know, we have ongoing quarterly conversations about: Are we prioritizing the right thing? Does our competitive moat still remain where we think it should be? And are we making the right kind of short-term, long-term investment trade-offs? This is also a very difficult thing to do in healthcare: is invest for things that don't pay for two, three, four years. Uh, I'm trying to, to find that balance, but it's it's tough. It's mm. a lot of you know a lot of hours. Mm. And, and, as you say, it's it's a tough thing to encourage investors to do. Um, what what are your, your sort of tips for you're in that conversation, you're in that office with an investor? How do you how do you sell your sell your product? Yeah, so um, we have two of the best investors in the world, and I I am very thankful that they were, you know, on one hand, one of our investors is, is Google with, with Google Ventures, uh, and the other large investor in Flatiron is, is Roche, which is a global biopharma company. And, and both of them take this very long-term, 10-year-plus view. So there's no discussion about, like, when are you going to IPO or when are you going to sell? or all, None of that pressure comes from our investor base because we had a conversation with them from day one, which is this is healthcare, this is slow, it's complicated, and it's, it's going to take time. Um, and, and both Roche and Google are, are on board with those, those kind of horizons and, you know, both have a very long-term view uh, in terms of investment philosophy. So I think for us, we've we just gotten lucky in, in having really good people around the table who are not, they're not short-term focused. And so making long-term investments is something where there's just generally consensus that it's a good thing to, uh, to do. Mm. And have you seen sort of a, just looking at the market generally, have you seen a sort of change in the types of investors who are eyeing up potential things they want to become healthcare Yeah, <laughs> so I think there's there's this like love affair now with uh, health tech companies, and and we're seeing um, typical traditional venture capital groups that have no backing or basis in healthcare start to look to make investments, and I think uh, a few will succeed, but most are going to get their lunch eaten uh, because they don't truly understand the market or um, the reimbursement landscape or something along those lines. I think the folks that have been in healthcare for, for a while, they, they understand, they know how to evaluate, and there's a bunch of very, very good VCs in, in the US at least that, that get it. Um, so, you know, in any market, there's some hype cycle. I think we're probably mm -hmm. up there in the hype. Uh, and eventually it will crash when, you know, a few of these companies um, go belly up, hopefully not us. <laughs> um, and then it'll kind of kickstart, you know, mm -hmm. again. Um, I think, Recognizing that healthcare investing is a discipline in itself. It's not tech investing. It's, mm -hmm. it's merging the two is, is really important. And you need people on your venture team who just who get it. And so, for example, the lead partner um, from Google Ventures who, who sits on our board is a physician himself. Uh, he also has a computer science background. He sees patients uh, once a week. So he's, he's in the world uh, that we live in, and he really mm -hmm. fundamentally understands it. Yeah. I think that's been, that's been really helpful. Must be huge, and um, you know you, you're a unicorn. Where next? What's what's sort of the the next the sort of five year plan for you? What's the? It's like a decacorn, right? Or what's Deca the ten? <laughs> some some bigger number. Uh, okay. I I think 
for us, um, it's it's proving that we're actually worth that number. Mm. Um, I think you know the valuation we got. This was about two years ago. Uh, was probably ahead of where um, we were in terms of numbers, and now we're you know building up to, to prove it. Uh, and then from there, for, for, you know, we have this really lovely problem, which is that oncology is one of the only areas where incentives are just aligned up up the stack. You know, from patient to physician to researcher to FDA. Everybody wants to develop and use better drugs, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we help help folks do. Um, and so I think there's a tremendous opportunity in front of us. The number that we get to, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get it as big as we can, and, mm -hmm. and I think that's a, um, a measuring stick of, of one type. Yeah. But, you know, we have other interests beyond just the money. Mm -hmm. um, we want to be able to move the, the industry forward to do research faster and cheaper and to get better drugs out to patients in a timeline that doesn't look like seven, eight, nine years, but looks much more condensed. Um, and th that's really the metric of success, I think, for us at the end of the day. And, and, and how are you going to grow and keep up that success? Is it, is it all about sort of organic growth? Is it about acquisitions? What's yeah, for everything we do as a company, and I think this is true of, uh, of any good startup, it's people. It's exclusively people. You know, you can have, you can be the smartest group of founders in the world or, you know, have the best investor. It doesn't, it kind of doesn't matter if you don't develop a company where the people that you work with are just better at their job than, than you would be. Um, and I think for us, we have spent an exorbitant amount of time interviewing, recruiting, coaching, mentoring, and, and bringing these, these experts in, um, firing when they're not doing well, and, and replacing and being open to, to saying, you know, this was a bad hire and, and actually we, we need some new talent. Um, I spend 30, 40% of my time somewhere around recruiting, either interviewing or, or closing. Um, and I think that obsession with people and obsession with recruiting is the only way to do it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how anyone else succeeds without, you know, an amazing team. Um, and I think for us, in terms of growth, you know, we have this really good optionality. We can grow organically, we can, we can acquire, we could raise more money if we wanted to, potentially. So um, we'll see. All are open. <laughs> no, fair enough. And I mean, how... As a sort of final question, what's your sort of your one your one big tip you'd give? You've talked about people, you've talked about being geeky about regulation. Is, yeah. there, is there anything else you'd, you'd like to add? I guess if if uh, depending on who what what the audience looks like, I, you know, I think if it's people interested in starting health companies, if you were health tech companies, sorry, um, it's not just tech. And I think that's like the lesson we learned very quickly is, you know, we have a great software background, and and you know, I'm been in, in software my whole life, but this is software is like a sliver of what we do and understanding healthcare and drug development and insurance and understanding it at a very detailed level. If you don't put the time and effort in to appreciate the market that you're in, which is healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, it's not going to work. And, and I think you kind of have to become obsessed with being a healthcare company at the end of the day. And you know, the amount of times I sit and I just ask, like, what, what, what does that mean, or why, or how does that work? I mean, this is now five and a half years in, uh, and I'm still doing that today of, of just asking why. And I yeah. think that's, that's the key, you know, yeah. just, just learning. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.